Uh, good afternoon and Happy New Year. Thank you very much for joining the webinar. My name is Hao Wang. I'm the program director for NINDS Create Bio program. Together with my colleagues here today, we are very grateful to have the opportunity to host a webinar by Dr. Jara Sherrock an overview of biotechnology product development, what to do, when, and why. Before we start, let me just say a few words about the Create Bio program. The program funds research that focuses on therapeutic development for disorders that fall under an INDS mission. The therapeutics can be biotechnology products and biologics, which broadly include peptides, proteins, oligonucleotides, gene therapies, cell therapies, and emerging entities, as well as combination products. And the stages can range from lead optimization to early clinical trials. The program has two tracks, the discovery track and the development track. The discovery track starts with leads uh, and ends with a well-characterized candidate. For example, the leads can be a monoclonal antibody or viral vector or a peptide that have demonstrated efficacy in relevant animal models. And during the discovery track, you can optimize or characterize the leads to uh, produce a candidate. The development track starts with a candidate and funds research that uh, conduct the IND enabling studies that lead to a IND application to the FDA or even small clinical trials. These funding opportunities are cooperative agreement mechanisms, and so we have two different versions. One is for the SBAR version through the U44 mechanism, and the other one is non-SBAR through the U01 for the discovery track and through the UH2, UH3 for the development track. So although the, uh, the webinar uh, will be, uh, so the webinar will mainly focus on recombinant proteins, uh, although some of these uh, aspects will be applicable to other therapeutic modalities. And uh, the webinar will be archived on our website. You can also print the handouts as you go along. And uh, you will be muted during the webinar. So, but please write your questions in the chat box, so if you hover your mouse over the screen box on top of the screen, you'll be able to uh, choose the selection like chat and please send your questions to everyone. And you can ask questions about our Create Bio program or questions to Dara uh, regarding the content of this webinar. Your questions will be answered at the end of the webinar and just a quick reminder again, the Create Bio application uh, receipt date this year of February 11th and August 11th. So with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Zara Sharak. Zara has deep experience in developing biotechnology products with a very impressive track record of global regulatory approval of five recombinant proteins and clinical development of dozens of therapeutics. She's currently Chief Medical, uh, Chief Dev Development Officer and a CMC Consultant at STC Biologics. And prior to that, she was heading the pharmaceutical and analytical development, also the head of uh, CMC program management at SIRE. And she has many other very impressive credentials that you can read about. But because of time, I'm going to turn to Zara and start the webinar. And thank you very much again for the joining. And Zara, you, sh uh, you should be seeing that your presenter is shown. Just one second. Yeah, while we're waiting for that, uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure uh, to be um, presenting this, this work around uh, product development. Um, Yes, thank you. Um, I can see that I'm a presenter now. Let me see if I can move the slide. Oh, um, oops, let's see. Uh, sorry, I, I uh, lost the... 
Uh, I can't see the slide. Okay, do you want me to, can you um, give, uh, give back to me the uh, presenter right and sure. I'll project the slides for you, Zara? Sure. Let me, uh, hmm, how did that happen? Hang on a second. There we go. Okay. Do you have it? Fine. Let's see. Presenter. Um, okay, please go ahead. Okay. There you go. Uh, but I can't see the slides for some reason. Hmm. Are you on page seven? Yes, I'm on page seven. Okay. All right. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So um, the outline of my presentation today, I'll um, I'll walk you through the different uh, stages or different phases of product development. I thought it would be important for you, even even though many of you may be in the early stage, more on the sort of the research, early research stage prior to development phase, um, to give you a sense of what you know, what does it need, what happens, you know, when you go in development, and what are some of the questions that are asked uh, to be able to move through the development phases, um, and really that transition from research to development. Um, uh, there, there is the development candidate selection. Um, I think that was it was um, uh, well mentioned. How how even in terms of the, the funding, there are two stages. You know, once you actually have a clinical candidate, uh, then you move forward. That selection of the clinical candidate, uh, there's some really key questions that need to be asked, certain activities that need to be done, um, and I'll walk through that. And then I'll describe, uh, obviously, uh, some of the studies that uh, are involved in some some uh, animal studies that need that are involved in developing in identifying a development candidate requires conducting pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So I'll speak uh, to those and how do you do, how do you do them, and actually show you case examples of um, some missteps, some some things that are sometimes forgotten or not. Uh, not uh, very well understood early on uh, because of the um, the discipline is not very well understood to, to a number of early investigators, and so I'm going to try to walk through that. So as your products move through, um, you ha you uh, you know you have a sense for them. Uh, next slide, please. So just before we start, some uh, definitions. Uh, TPP or tar target product profile. Many of you may have heard this. Uh, what this is is, you know, what is the? It's really around what what is the target, you know, uh, aspects of your product that you're looking for. What sh what should be the indication? What kind of behavior do you want to see in you know of the drug in vivo? How you know where is it made? How do you store it? And and basically, when a drug is approved, uh, there's a package insert. You know, when you when you go and buy you know drugs. Um, you it actually have a package insert, and uh, for for uh, approve, for approving drugs, you need to have all the information around that package insert. I will describe what you need to do in terms of uh, defining target product profile for early stages. So we'll speak to that during the the webinar. Uh, pharmacokinetics that I would abbreviate as PK. That's the drug concentration over time in vivo in either animals and humans from the time of administration until it disappears from the blood compartment. And then eventually, typically you're talking about blood pharmacokinetics, but obviously uh, drugs may go from blood into certain tissue compartments, and you could follow that also in tissues um, uh, of interest. Pharmacodynamics refers to now the impact of the drug. So you have a certain drug concentration, but what is the impact in the disease, uh, either model or in, or in human, during the time that that drug is, is hanging around in the body? So uh, again, I would refer that to PD. Uh, you, you, it's really a sort of a biomarker or, or an early sign of efficacy of the drug. Uh, the concept of relevant species is, a, is an important one. We'll be talking about it when we speak to the to toxicology studies. It's a, a species that has the tissues cross-react with the drug that you're developing for humans. Uh, if it doesn't cross-react, then you really don't have a relevant model, and so you cannot really predict what the toxicity in humans. And ther therapeutic window or therapeutic index really refers to the that um, the, the dose and regimen uh, range that you're giving that is efficacious but not toxic. Okay. Next slide, please. 
So this uh, flow chart kind of uh, depicts the, the stages of product development. Um, again, many of you are in the research phase. That's when you're trying to identify a, a target that links to a disease. Uh, then uh, when a development candidate is selected, are we ready to do development effort? And um, the, the phases are uh, basically of a number of preclinical studies to, to identify what should be the dose and regimen, the PKPD, as I mentioned, then, then toxicology studies. Then the phase one clinical study is really, uh, phase one and phase two refer to what's called the human proof of concept. So you've done animal proof of concept in, in early stages, in preclinical phases, and then there's a human proof of concept where you're showing uh, in phase one uh, what would be the, the uh, doses that are, it's really looking at safety. So what, how high can you go while it's just safe in, in uh, humans? And then phase two, you're looking at now starting to look at either biomarkers or some, or some safety, uh, some, uh, sorry, some efficacy signs, uh, and you're really identifying the dose and the frequency of dosing. And really the, the efficacy, the true efficacy trial, statistically significant is the phase three. And then um, when the drug is ready for, for submission to the agency for approval, it's either a biological license application, which refers to for biologics, that's what you file, uh, or actually if it's a small molecule, it's called NDA, the new drug application. And then it, the work doesn't end at that point. There are a number of um, post-marketing commitments and additional you know, post-licensure post of what's called phase four, where maybe you want to expand label, you want to do pediatric studies or other additional safety, uh, accumulation of safety data and so forth. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing program uh, once you have a product in, the, in uh, commercialized. Next slide, please. So uh, what are some of the, what do you look for? What are some of the questions and what, what do you do in these different phases, um, particularly in the, you know, that, that uh, development candidate selection phase? So, so first in research, as mentioned, you're trying to link some sort of a target to a disease and you're screening different compounds that affect that target. These are typically start in vitro, right? You're looking at maybe binding to a particular um, receptor or, um, or blocking a particular antigen. Um, typically, you're dealing with microgram scale, maybe milligram of you know, preparation of compounds in this phase, and the, the compounds are being tested in animal models, in animal efficacy models. So it's really, as mentioned, that's your animal proof of concept. At that point, um, now you have, uh, let's say you show some success, now you need to um, actually uh, generate something that is a, a clinical candidate. So let's say in early phase, maybe you're due, you have a mouse model to actually generate the mouse uh, protein. Now you actually have to have a suitable cell line for something that you're going to put into humans. Um, so uh, a lot of what's called CMC activities begin at this stage. CMC stands for Chemistry, Manufacturing, and Control. And it refers to everything about the physical product, you know, how you make it, how you keep it stable, what formulation, what analyses. So those are some work that begin at this stage um, to show that you have something that you can, um, you can actually take later on into the clinic. Um, the material, the compound at this stage, you need to show that it has adequate stability or solubility. Let's say, you know, if the compound, you've been able to make it fresh and, and have done some animal studies, but if you can't keep it refrigerated for, you know, eventually for two years, which is what ultimately you need, well, then that's not going to be a development candidate. Uh, so, and I can speak to some of the examples of studies that you need to do during this phase. Um, this is when you do PK and try to correlate the, the in vivo um, drug levels to the action of the drug, the, the PD, uh, uh, activity of the drug, based on which you define the dose and regimen um, and the route of administration. Uh, this is when one would do tissue cluster activity to identify the relevant animal models and um, you're scaling the material to presumably at this point you're going to get into the hundreds of mix and maybe even gram level. And then you're ready to do um, what's called IND enabling work. So before going to humans, um, a investigation new drug, IND stands for investigation new drug application form has to be filed with whatever regulatory agency that you're, uh, whichever country that you're going to be doing those studies. And for that, um, uh, what's called GLP toxicology studies are needed. So you can do some initial toxicology studies um, 
uh, say uh, you know in a, in a with with a you know with a lab or even in your own lab, but when it is uh, when it's IND enabling, it's done under what GLP stands for Good Laboratory Practice, uh, which means that it's documented and certain there's certain requirements around dose solution analysis and um, dose stability and you know their their guidances around that. So those toxicology studies enable the going into humans. The manufacturing process, so all the CMC work has to be done now, and the manufacturing process is scaled up typically to, again, many, many grams, if not kilos, depending on, uh, say, for example, antibodies. Sometimes you need a lot for doing early, early work. And uh, early in, in development phase, you're looking into what should be, what would be project the market demand to be, and therefore what kind of scale do I need, what kind of um, cost of good can I tolerate. Uh, so basically, you're talking about financial feasibility of, of, of developing the program. It's beyond technical feasibility. Um, and of course, you have to have a clinical design and, and clinical protocol to be able to then move forward into human proof of concept. Okay. Next slide, please. So with regards to target product profile, um, if you just look at the basically here's it's 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 allowing you to have a directed thinking about the information you need to register the drug eventually. So for early stages, this is really a living document. It's going to change over time as you get more information. At the beginning, you may know very little. You may only know some in vitro information, but really, uh, it's not until um, you know as, as you go through the through the preclinical phase, you're going to collect more information, and you'll have what's listed on the right side, which is the package insert information, lots and lots of information around the, the use and indication and the contraindications and the warnings and so forth. But early stage on the left side of the slide set, the preclinical stage, um, the first thing you need to decide is what is the primary indication that you're going to take this drug into? What is the target population? Um, do they need to be, should they be adults? Can you use them in early, state, early uh, ages? Uh, specific conditions they may or may not have? What would you actually have to exclude? Um, how long, you know, what, what is the route of administration and how long? What is the duration of administration? Is this something acute? You've got to give it as an IV acute or it's chronic and they have to, you have to consider it and may perhaps go into a sub-Q administration because it's a lifelong, you know, for lifelong disease. Um, the regimen is the frequency of administration. Um, again, you know, weekly, monthly, is it a bolus, is it an infusion, uh, bolus meaning a, a quick, or is it a, like a, a sustained infusion? And what would be your endpoint? Um, what kind of what kind of clinical data do you need to collect? So those are all efficacy related, what I call the efficacy related. Then a CMC related, which as I mentioned, it's around you know what what is the actual physical product. Um, what is it going to look like? Is it liquid? Do you need to lyophilize it? Is it going to be in a vial or a pre-filled syringe? So those are the questions you need to ask. Um, you know, the moment you have some, what looks promising in, in an in vitro uh, proof of, you know, uh, proof of concept, you need to ask these questions. What do I need to develop? And of course, from the safety perspective, what kind of risks? It's really a risk assessment. Um, what does this drug? What would it potentially, uh, what kind of in vivo risk would it have? Is it going to have uh, immunogenic properties? Is it going to have certain side, side effects because of its um, uh, perhaps receptor specificity or, or lack of, for that matter? Those are the information you need to collect early on. Next slide, please. Um, yep, there we go. So. Um, I tried to summarize and kind of simplify the preclinical, the key preclinical steps uh, towards development, and, I'm, and there are really six steps. So the first one, again, I'm sure you're all doing that, is you, you have to identify a target that relates to a disease. It's either through literature. In some cases, it's actually natural history. For example, um, I was at Shira, was involved with a lysosomal enzyme disorder. And a number of times you cannot really do, you're really looking at the natural history of the disease to then predict, you know, what kind of a clinical trial you're going to design. There's, it's not like, there's not always animal models or um, things you can do other than collecting natural history. Or you would do obviously your own studies and, and develop your own disease model. Then you're going to identify a ligand, you know, for that target. That's your compound. And that you need to show that that has a dose-dependent effect. If it's not dose-dependent, then you cannot speak to its specificity, right? You want something that is specific, and you can control the dose around its 
uh, activity and safety. So, for example, it's binding to something, you know, either as an agonist or an antagonist, and then in vivo it has some sort of a efficacy in an animal model. The next one, um, the next one is you, so typically what you'll do is an in vitro, in an in vitro, say, binding assay, you would look for the IC50 and IC90. IC50 is, it's really telling you about the efficacious dose, right? So you know you need to be at least that, you know, above that at the site of action for it to be effective. IC90 is a really useful one um, parameter because when you dose, uh, you know, the drug is going, and I'll show you in a, in a couple of slides, the drug will disappear over time, right, in the blood. But you want to then define when do I dose again so the activity continues, and that, that IC90 actually defines your trough level, what's the minimum level before you dose again. And I'll show you with graphics later on. Then the next step is you want to, as mentioned, identify a relevant species. So you're going to get, you know, maybe uh, many, many, you know, 30, 40, 50 different um, types of tissues from different animal models, from rodents, and, and, and for a number of times for biologics, you actually will use um, non-human primates. And you show, do I have this spike compounds show reactivity, cross reactivity, um, you know, compared to the human tissue, does it show a similar reactivity to the animal uh, tissues or not? And that's how you select, you know, what should be your efficacy um, or safety models, actually, um, safety uh, animal models. Next. Yeah, if you can click one more. Yeah. So at this point, um, you would conduct a single dose PK. So, uh, but it's a dose escalation. You, you start with certain dose that you know is going to, that from, from your in vitro studies, you know it's going to show some activity and you can keep going up. And basically you're looking for a region where um, your PK is linear, and I'll describe what that means. Uh, but also uh, what is the, what would be the, eventually you want to identify what's the maximum tolerated dose. Um, what's the maximum dose that you can give? Sometimes this maximum feasible dose, for example, if you can never get it enough in solution, for a lot of biologics, you actually don't reach MTD. Uh, they could be pretty safe um, at the, you know, at the hundreds of mix that you, you know, that you give them in, in animals. Uh, in which case, basically, it's maximum feasible, whatever you can actually make and put in solution. Now, in terms of PK, um, you're looking for a region where, with a single dose PK, where um, the area under the curve, AUC stands for area under the curve, right, of the dose of the dose time effect, is actually reaching saturation, meaning that whatever receptors or whatever it has to bind to, or tissues, the things that it's binding to, it max it saturated them. Now, your uh, PK is actually linear with dose. And that defines basically your, your sort of your minimum dose of people that you want to go with. So from the single dose PK, now you do multiple dose PK. In a, in a, and here you actually do them in a, in a, in a disease model uh, where you're trying to use that to establish PK-PD relationship, right? The relationship between blood level and activity in, in vivo. Um, that helps you define what should be the frequency of dosing. As mentioned, you know, you try to, as soon as you reach IC90, you want to actually dose again. But you also you want to show that there's no accumulation, um, and it doesn't ha accumulation does not occur when you're in the linear uh, uh, PK range of dosing. Um, and here's where you start now getting a sense for therapeutic window, right? You're seeing efficacy, but at what point are you going to start seeing toxicity? So these are really the six key activities you're going to conduct in preclinical phase, uh, you know, to get then into to have a development candidate and proceed into an IND enabling study. Next slide, please. So some fundamentals around PK and PD. So the first one I'm showing you a single dose, of what's called two compartment model. If you see, look at the look at the um, the blue line or, or the one that is coming from say about 100. So, so the the y-axis is the concentration of drug in the blood. The x-axis is the time. Um, and um, in blue is where the drug is, is dropping very rapidly, and then you actually see there are two phases, right? And then it's sl slowing down. So you can actually um, take this data and, and fit it into what's called a two-compartment model. You see a very fast elimination, you know, uh, initial uh, fast uh, distribution phase, and then it's eliminating what's called the beta phase uh, at a different, at a slower rate. This is typical of biologics. There's at least two compartment, if not more, actually. The next slide. 
and their software, of course, to fit all this data with. So uh, the next one shows the um, on the uh, y-axis is actually the clearance, uh, which is uh, a calculated value of how many, how much, you know, blood basically, what is the clearance rate, right, per kilo of body weight, as opposed to as a function of dose. And what you see is that it's, it's, it has a it has a saturation. So its clearance actually um, is is maybe very high at the beginning because there are many things that are um, very. It's a high clearance. It's faster clearing because there are many tissues, there are many things that it's reacting to. The drug is interacting with. But at some point, you've saturated everything, and now there's no more sync. And now uh, it's no longer dose dependent. The clearance is no longer dose dependent. If you actually convert it on the right side, that's where steady, basically your your serum levels, right, reaches a saturation. And that's where you want to pick. Actually, uh, you want to be in a region where uh, you're uh, you've passed the nonlinear phase uh, to start dosing humans. Next uh, one uh, shows uh, what happens with the multiple dose TK. Now, if you actually have selected uh, a region where you're not, uh, you you're actually are saturating. Then with uh, with dose with repeat dosing, um, you actually will not see accumulation. So so each of those curves going up and down is uh, is the blood level you dose. Blood level go, you know goes up and then it disappears to reach a trough level. And then you're dosing again and it dis disappears and so forth. So typically you want to do this multiple dose PK after you've done a single dose. And look for this, you know, the timing of the trough and the levels, um, and then adjust, you know, adjust how to dose, how, how frequently you want to dose. Next um, is this relationship between pharmacokinetics, the blood level of drug, and activity. So what's plotted is on the y-axis is the percent. Uh, response. So this could be either uh, a therapeutic effect, for example, um, you know, efficacy marker, or it could actually be toxicity. So whatever that percent response is, and on the x-axis is actually the dose level, right? So what you see on the leftmost uh, graph um, is the efficacy um, signal. So, for example, as you keep dosing more and more, you get to see more and more either a number of animals responding or higher response rate. Let's say if this is a tumor shrinkage or whatever the efficacy marker is, uh, you know, you, you basically have this curve uh, which would have, uh, you know, which would have, you know, basically a saturation level of dose response. So typically, um, you pick your, your ED50, meaning that, uh, sorry, ED10, so at 10% of response, when you start doing your dose escalation PK study. And then um, on the right side, on the, the right-hand curve, the, the red um, curve, is the toxicity. So you may not see any toxicity, say, in this case, like above, let's say, maybe that's 20, 30 uh, mix per kg. But then all of a sudden, you're going to start seeing toxic effects, right? And typically, that's very steep, usually, you know. Um, and um, the level of drug below which you have no observable address, uh, event, the NOEL level, is where typically in your um, IND enabling talk studies you, you want to show that I've gone this high and I have no observable adverse events um, or toxic effects. Um, and MTD is basically is somewhere on that curve, pretty low on that curve where it's maximally tolerated. You're not killing it's toxic, but it's, you know, maximally uh, how should I say, you can tolerate some toxicity, but obviously beyond which, you know, the animals are dying or it's very severe. So the therapeutic index, sorry, can, can you go back? So the safety factor or the therapeutic index is the difference between those two curves, right? Is that window uh, between those two curves, okay? Yeah, next slide, please. Um, so I want to show you a couple of examples, of case examples of things that could happen to you. So here's a case of a protein that uh, what if you can't find actually uh, any, uh, detect any tissue binding of the drug, um, and this, this is from a real case, by the way. Well, it so turns out that, you know, when you're doing, um, when you're looking at tissue binding, you're actually generally are um, preserving, right? You're fixing using formaldehyde soaked tissue and so forth. Um, and proteins may be nature, so they may actually use their epitope and you won't necessarily detect 
you know, it's binding, so you wouldn't, you, you would not find a relevant species. And so one solution for that is, if you could click, yeah, one solution is actually avoid uh, doing um, a, a tissue binding, again, particularly if that protein cannot tolerate. Uh, you instead can do biodistribution studies using other methodologies. You can do autoradiography. You could have a radioactive compound. Sorry, can you go back? You could have a, yeah, can you go back to the, yeah. You could have a, um, uh, a radioactive compound and look for that right in cross sections or what's called positive uh, emission tomography where you could have uh, labeled the protein with a, with an alpha emitter and follow actually non-invasively in vivo where the drug went. Next slide, please. Um, here's an example of uh, when you're trying to do, uh, you know, look, look for binding and get some, uh, you know, binding dose response curve with, uh, with a drug and let's say receptor. Uh, and I've seen this a lot actually being a consultant where the hook effect is missed. And so let me explain that. So um, in a typical, uh, say, PK, you're doing a PK ELISA. If you look at the schematic on the right, you have a plate, you're capt you have a capture antibody that captures the drug and then you have a readout antibody that is, let's say, for example, HRP labeled, or something that, that, uh, that provides, you, you know, provides a signal for readout. Um, as you increase the amount of uh, drug, add, in this case, as you increase the amount of drug added to the plate, the absorbance should keep going up, right? But um, I've seen where people have gone, if you go too far up, actually, now you have an inverse relationship. It's beyond what's called the hook effect, where you keep, you keep adding more and more drugs, but you actually get less and less signal. And the way you, you, you know this is actually the other way around. Um, you've added a drug, you do different dilution series, right? And you see that as you're diluting it, the signal is actually going up as opposed to going down. You know if that happens you're on the right side of the hook effect, and you have to keep going. You have to keep diluting until you reach the other side where as you dilute, the, the, the response goes down, and it's linearly it's proportional. If you're diluting twofold, the response should go down twofold. If it's not, it's in a nonlinear range, and the numbers don't make sense. You actually would have the wrong EC50 or wrong whatever measurement that you did in that ELISA. And I've seen that a lot um, where you actually underestimate um, you know, the, the actual blood level. Next slide. Um, here's another case where, which is also pretty common, where you have actually a circulating blood antigen or ligand. Now what do you do, right? That is going to interfere with your drug connotation because it's going to be bound. So typically in this case, you have to have assays that measure the bound and the free drug. And to measure the free drug, you have to have, uh, typically if you're using, if it's a bio, you know, for biologics, for proteins, you have antibodies, right, to detect the drug. You have to find an antibody that is non-blocking uh, with the antigen. Um, if you can click more. So, so here's, uh, let's say, for example, uh, a case, let's say you're developing an, an antibody, and actually a human antibody. How are you going to do that readout? It's very complicated because and a great example is anti HER2, right? Test do them up. Um, patients are shedding antigen, the HER2 itself. So if you want to measure, um, uh, let's say, anti HER2, you have two issues. First, you're trying to measure something that is an antibody to a human antibody, right? And also, um, to, sorry, to a human antigen, but you also have antigen in the, in the blood. So first, um, you have to find an antibody that is not blocked by HER2 binding to anti-HER2. And the other one is that your readout has to be an anti-human IDZ1 um, so because you're measuring a human antibody. Um, and then to measure the, um, so that allows you to measure the, um, the, to measure the bound, right? So sorry, to measure the bound, you will buy, you would capture the bound with anti HER2 that is not blocking, and you read out with anti HEG1. To measure the free, you actually uh, capture it with HER2 itself, right? Because if the antibody is not bound to the antigen, you'll capture it on the HER2 antigen itself. Okay. So here's an example. Another example is um, we're working with a client that is working with eotaxin. They're developing an anti-eotaxin and it's an IgG4. And that was kind of complicated because blood levels and certain inflammation, inflammatory diseases have eotaxin uh, in, in blood. So what we had to do is that you, we had to capture um, the eotaxin with the, with the antibody that we're developing and then um, 
then use a readout uh, monoclonal antibody that does not detect human IgG4. The, the blood has a lot of IgG4, so if I use any general, uh, you know, anti-IgG4, it would react to my drug. So I had to identify an antibody that does not react to human IgG4, only to the drug. Um, and then we ended up having to dilute the serum enough that the eotaxid eventually, because it's, it's an on-off rate, right, eventually does not interfere with the, with the assay. So it's really complicated um, developing these PK assays. Next slide, please. Now, what about what's called ADA assay? These are, again, these are things you need to do pretty quickly after you have a drug, you know, a drug, what you think you have a drug candidate in order to uh, be able to develop the program. Uh, so ADA stands for anti-drug antibodies. So for biologics, when you inject them, particularly when you multiple inject the, the antibody or the, or the biologic, um, the body develops antibodies to them. And you need to know, so it's a safety concern. The immunogenicity or developing anti-drug antibody is a safety concern for biologics. And so um, uh, one needs to have assays that detects, do you have actually these antibodies in the blood? Particularly, yeah, if you can click on the next one. Um, yeah, next, uh, yeah. Uh, particularly because it could actually neutralize the activity of the drug. You know, an antibody can bind to the, to the site of uh, the site of action or the site of activity of the drug and therefore neutralize it. Uh, it could obviously result in anaphylactic reactions. Um, one of the things that are sometimes um, ignored is when you make a drug in a particular cell line, the whole cell proteins that are actually uh, made um, co-purify with the enzyme, with the protein, with the product. Uh, those can generate antibodies in patients upon repeat dosing, and those could actually, and, and it used to be um, very early on in some in some yeast um, cell, cell lines, there were actually were anaphylactic reactions, unfortunately, in patients to the host cell proteins that co-purify with the proteins. So it's really important, the immunogenicity of, of the drug is really, really important, or of what comes with the drug itself is important. The other thing is that the PK would be unusual, right? So let's say you've dosed, the first two doses, you have beautiful linear PK response, and then all of a sudden, you're, you know, you see that you have very low blood levels, even though you, you know, you're injected the same amount of drug. Well, it so turns out, turns out that if an antibody binds to it, it's going to get cleared faster. So here's an example in this figure. Um, let me walk you through. So uh, basically, on the, the top one, uh, the top uh, straight line is where. Um, Basically, if you have if you don't if you if you have an antibody that or you have a or you have no anti-drug antibody, you should uh, pretty much get the same um, Cmax right in a drug. Your, your drug level should be the same with multiple injections. But if you generate antibodies to a drug, then um, you'll see that with increased dosing, you have less and less levels actually. So. Uh, so the drug level is decreasing. You dose the next time around. It's actually not going up as high, and it's dropping, you know, more. And depending on where that antibody is reacting to, you could have, you know, faster clearance. For example, in this case, the drug is an antibody, and the anti-drug, the ADA, was actually against FC, and that um, uh, cleared uh, actually not as fast as it would if you actually had the the anti-drug anti antibody against the, the fab portion, and it really depends on the product. Um, so you could, really, you could really have very unusual PK profiles. So uh, understanding the, the level and the formation of neutralizing or of uh, antibodies um, in blood helps you interpret the PK data as well. Okay, next slide, please. Now, uh, developing an ADA assay itself is also could be pretty complicated. So typically, you have you lay down the drug right on the plate, you add the uh, the serum, for example, the serum from pa animals or or patients. Um, so, the if you have any anti-drug antibody, it should bind to that right to the plate, and then you read it out with the anti-IgG. Presume the majority of the of the antibodies ADAs are actually IgG, and most of them are actually IgG1. In some cases, you have you could have IgE, in which case you should um, there are anti in general, you know, anti-Igs, not necessarily IgG. So if you can click, please. Um, so the the biggest problem becomes where are you going to get and in order to, to develop an assay, you have to have an anti-drug antibody. Well, where are you going to get that from, right? So you're starting from a program. 
um, you don't have, there's nothing, right? So it's actually really important to think early for biologics, to think early and develop, you know, immunized animals and try to get some antibody to your drug. Um, and I'm, I'm mentioning here include monkeys because it's eventually going to need that for your, for your top studies. Um, the other thing is the sensitivity of that assay has to be about per FDA guidance, has to be around, you know, half a microgram per mile, 200 to 500 nanogram per mile. So that anti-drug antibody needs to be pretty, pretty good, has to be pretty sensitive. Um, it also has to be pretty specific because if it recognizes other IgGs in your human serum, you know, then, you, you know, you have way too high of a level. And actually, we, were, we had clients where uh, they were in phase three, and all of a sudden, you know, they were, they were trying to develop an assay, and all of a sudden they were seeing what looked like a huge signal. They were panicking, you know, what do we do? And it turned out to be all artifact. It was really cross-reactivity to other things in blood, and it took a, quite a long time to figure out what those other things are, and it wasn't their drug. I mean, luckily enough, it was not a drug. So moving forward, let's say you've done all this. Now you have to develop, you have to do toxicology studies. As I, as I mentioned, you have to have a, for toxicology studies, you have to have a relevant species. Um, so you do in vitro studies, the IC50 of the animal cells, right, is the same as the human cells or similar, close enough. You would do tissue class reactivities, different organs, and find, a, specifically, this is a good time to find what kind of organ specific toxicity, you know, would you, could, could potentially occur. And then there's an ICH uh, guideline, F6, which, by the way, you can go to www.fda.gov and type in ICH, and you can read a, a number of ICH guidelines. You know, for once you start getting close to, close to development phase, you know, highly recommend to read them. There are the non-clinical ones, it's F6. There are CM, all kinds of CMC and quality guidelines which you can read and be familiarized what is it that the agency looks for. So for recombinant proteins, you have to have two relevant species, and this makes it really complicated. Um, let me just give you an, as an example in small molecule drugs, or drugs. Typically, you do like a, maybe a rat or some rodent, and then a lot of times you use a dog because the rodent usually is your non-relevant, maybe it's just a general tox, and the dog is a, is a good one because you can do, um, you know, oral, um, it's good for actually for oral, uh, mimicking oral uptake. Um, finding two relevant species is to be really tricky. Um, and so sometimes um, we, you, maybe you can justify, say, look, you've tried and you can only find one, like rodents may sometimes not be relevant at all. Um, and sometimes you can actually argue not using a non-relevant species. Um, particularly European agencies are actually really open to not using a lot of animals, animals studies, not, not killing a lot of animals. So in that regard, it's really good to come and say, look, I've identified, you know, I've screened a number of tissues and organs and species, and here's my relevant species, and therefore I'm going to do talk studies on that. And as mentioned, again, my experience has been that a number of times the, the, the best relevant species for, for biologics, for, for uh, recombinant proteins, is, is monkey. Um, I've had an example where either sino or rhesus didn't even work. So we unfortunately had to do the study in a chimpanzee, and that's, or a transgenic animal. And that's obviously very expensive and very, um, you know, it's not ethical if you, don't, if you uh, can avoid it. Next. Um, and in tox, tox studies, you're doing dose escalation, you're doing multiple doses, and, and you go factors, you know, many factors, three, five, ten times higher until you reach MPT, and then you have a recovery phase. And then you stop dosing and you make sure that whatever safety signal toxicity you saw, is it actually reversible or not? Those are the questions you have to answer based on which you design your clinical program. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, I mentioned to you in terms of uh, small molecules, you know, Typically, you do a non-relevant and a relevant model, so it's different for biologics. Now, what if you really cannot find a cross-reacting species? I mean, that, that could happen. Um, if you can click, please. Yeah, click one more. Yeah. In this case, you wouldn't be able to predict toxicity, right? So you actually have, and, I, and I've had a situation like this where we actually had to make the animal version of the protein to, because the human protein was not, you know, cross-reacting with the animal. Uh, tissues. So we had to do the talk study with the animal version, um, or uh, an alternative is you actually generate, um, if you can click these, uh, generate transgenic, uh, you know, animals. So, um, you, you, or you make, like, you make a humanized mouse, you know, to do talk studies, or you have knockouts or, and so forth, and then you put, the, you put the human gene in there, you knock it in, and then develop that. So those are rare events, but just something that, to be aware of. 
Next slide, please. So early talk studies. Uh, you find a relevant species, you do tissue cluster activity, you have to identify the age and physiological state and define that. Is this for, if you're doing, you know, um, studies in pediatrics, you have to do actually juvenile, you know, animals. Makes it more complicated. Um, you can early on use non-naive animals, uh, not for GLP enabling tufts, but early tufts, uh, you know, you know that certain, a lot of drugs, you know, clear very fast. So if you waited beyond the recovery phase and the drug has cleared, the previous drug has cleared, you can use those non-naive, it's cheaper, it's okay for early studies. Um, typically, you take maybe three, three doses per arm. It's easier to start with male animals, just male animals. You don't have complications, uh, you know, hormonal complications. Later on, for again, for, for IND enabling, you, you would have to show, uh, if, if the drug is to be used in both males and females, you have to do both. Uh, 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 genders, tox studies. But in early trials, you maybe pick a low, a mid, you know, that is kind of efficacious and a higher, the high dose that's near MTD. And uh, typically you go, let's say you start dose escalation, you can start with the very low level and then do either factors of 10 or 3, again, depending on what range you have to play with. Uh, as mentioned, uh, you typically find the no observable adverse effect level um, and maximum feasible dose. And, and um, from that, then you design your clinical. Uh, so in a talk study, you're doing clinical observations, you know, your weight and height, and, uh, sorry, your weight and um, uh, just the general appearance, and then you do blood chemistry, the, and then histopathology. And of course, for, for biologists, you have to do immunogenicity, which you don't do um, in, in small molecules. Next slide, please. Now, here's an example of, I mean, you, you may think it's silly, but it, it's a real example. It occurred at a big pharma, and in an early stage, they, the, basically they were doing, they had seen that a particular drug was uh, using, they, they were using a Drosophila model, and they saw eye loss, actually, in that model. And it's like, okay, this is in Drosophila, kind of who cares? They went and did this preclinical studies and clinical studies, um, obviously not in Drosophila, you know, the preclinical, and it was pretty good. But in patients, they started seeing blindness. And they started going back and had to go back and say, well, but we have actually seen that in Drosophila, you know, so maybe there's something to it. Well, it turned out that there is there is an impact. This particular drug has an impact on the eye. I mean, the program died, obviously. But, um, you know, don't ignore data. The, the data was, like, basically ignored. Um, it, it'll be good to really understand if there is a toxicity, what does that mean? Is it real? And, and really follow up on it and not on that, just ignore it. Okay, next slide. Um, so soliciting your CMC experts early on in the program. This is the one, again, being a person who's more on the, as I said, on the, on the CMC, on the actual physical part of the product. Uh, that's the last thing that people think about, right? Everybody's very busy trying to, um, trying to come up with something that is effective in some animal model, and, you know, coming up with, with all kinds of, uh, you know, maybe different drugs. But um, what do your CMC folks bring to you? They, obviously, they, you know, those, those are the folks who know how to make cell lines that are stable. You have to have a stable cell line for, for uh, clinical programs. Uh, they, they would know how to grow them, such that the titer is high and it's reproducibly high. At some point, a drug may not be uh, financially feasible because you cannot make it. Um, and unfortunately, that would be unfortunate, right? Because it's wonder drug, right? Early on, that you cannot actually make it. They would know how to purify it to appropriate purity and reproducibility. And again, I'm using this word reproducibility uh, because a number of times in early research, you just need to make something once and, and you know show something. But um, you know, now if you have a developmental candidate, you need to be able to make it over and over and over the same with the same characteristics. Uh, another thing that is often forgotten, and I'll give you a couple of examples, is, again, your CMC folks would know what, what kind of buffer excipients should they put the protein in. Can you freeze it even? How, you know, how do you keep it happy, right? So whatever you have today, a month from now, is the same thing. The other thing is around characterizing, characterizing protein structure and relating it to activity with analytical tools like HPLC, like mass spec, and looking at, for example, glycosylation, is it important, and so forth. Um, next slide. So uh, the link between preclinical and CNC, here's I'm showing you the activity and also sort of the time links between them. So early on, obviously, CNC folks are not involved. You're trying to identify a compound that impacts certain clinical targets, disease targets, and you're doing in vitro binding studies. But this is the time where now you need to make, start making compounds. Early on, maybe you're making different versions of those compounds. Um, 
to do PK and PD and dose regimen, it's really important to characterize the structure function relationship. Um, People do that for small molecules very readily, right? It's, it's a common thing to do. For biologics, it's not that often done um, because if you find one, you think that's it and we can run with it. But understanding what is critical about that protein, you know, does it, for example, maybe it needs to be dimeric in solution to be active. Um, if you don't know that and you, you always purify the monomer or you, you've haphazardly purified dimer once, but next time around, you know, you don't have the dimer and you've lost that efficacy, you don't know why. Um, does it have reasonable solubility? Is it reasonably stable? Um, which sequence to select? You can look for certain hot spots, certain degradation sites on the protein and actually, uh, you know, if, if you want, you can manipulate and, and take it out. You can mutate and take it out to have a better uh, clinical candidate. Next slide, please. So here's an example, unfortunately, of a IND enabling uh, development no-go, unfortunately. So uh, there was a drug that was, uh, it was an anti-cancer drug that showed beautiful you know, effectiveness in animal models. In the primate tox studies, it showed severe toxicity. The program died. And actually, and I was personally involved in this one where I was on the, as I said, I was on the CMT side, I was doing some biophysical studies, and I showed that this particular cytokine actually trimerizes the human receptor. It was required for spy activity. That, that actually was a collaboration with research. But uh, the study was done in monkeys, but it actually dimerized the monkey receptor. So later on, we found out that dimerization of the monkey receptor actually triggers a cellular toxicity that you won't see with a human cytokine. So when we, when we were using the human cytokine on human cells, it was, right, it was not dimerizing. When we were using the monkey cytokine on monkey cells, it was not dimerizing. But when we were using the human cytokine on the monkey cell, it was dimerizing and it was therefore being um, toxic. What's weird is that this, was, this difference between the human and the monkey cytokine was one amino acid. And that affected how it trimerized. And it was the cause of toxicity. So we went back actually to the, with the program. We actually made the monkey cytokine. We showed that it's absolutely clean in toxicology studies. The program came back to life, and we proceeded into clinical development. Um, but here's where it really that the, the 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 people who understand formulation analytical characterization could help you know rescue a program uh, when you see something weird like this. So that that um, collaboration is I think really important. Next slide. Here's um, a, uh, another example of what was a basically, unfortunately, uninformed GO decision. So this was an enzyme. It showed great activity in animal models. Uh, the program moved into IND stage, and the molecule came to the process development group, but the molecule we made in process development actually did not show activity, any animal efficacy. And it also had significant solubility issues. We couldn't even reach the high level. So it took about quite a few months to go back and forth between research and development. And we talked, so what, you know, what's going on, right? It was, as you might imagine, there was a lot of angst at the, for the program. And it turned out, if you can click um, on the bullets, it turned out that the efficacy studies were done with the mouse enzyme. Of course, the development folks were making the human enzyme. The human enzyme was significantly different. It had different charge variants. The glycosylation was different than the human enzyme, and it didn't show activity to the mouse cells that were used in vitro in the animal model. So unfortunately, we actually, this, this took a year and a half and a one and a half million dollars spent, and this is a real program, unfortunately, to show that this program will not work the way, the way it was designed. And at least the human protein is not gonna work the way you thought you know, it did in animals. And um, I don't know since then if the program has been picked up other ways, but, it's a lot of time and money wasted, unfortunately, uh, as, a, as a poor basis of development, go decision, without any kind of analytical characterization. So um, here's an example of a, of a drug that we had to develop for, uh, as an it was an enzyme replacement therapy, but it was to be delivered um, into the brain. So uh, because, as you know, many proteins, actually almost no protein passes blood brain barrier except for certain receptor-mediated ones. So uh, from the clinical, we needed to get, uh, the, the, basically they told us the dose, we want to dose no more than once a month. They wanted to deliver, of course, your volume limited, less than one amount. Uh, this is in children, so we needed some sort of a device. And the, the drug has to be filtered before administration. And I wouldn't use this example as, as one where, again, your CMC folks and the clinical folks, preclinical, clinical need to really talk. So 
So the implication of that clinical demand was that we had to have 100 micromel soluble and stable protein. We were very limited in the formulation composition. Basically, the only approved drug is in salt and water <laughs> that you can, you know, put into the brain. Um, and so, how are you going to formulate something to be, you know, stable and soluble, particularly proteins, where you usually need buffers. You you cannot live with salt and water alone. And the endotoxin limit is much lower than IV. Um, so again, in terms of manufacturing, we had to be much, much more careful. And we had to have a device, some sort of an intercecal device that is small enough and it grows with children, you know, and so forth. So we actually, you know, again, this was developed, the real case example, it was developed and um, I'm not sure, next slide, I'm not sure if I give the specific example. Um, yeah, so what we did is that, um, just to add to the, to the hurdle, um, you know, we, the, the enzyme in vivo, the, if you look at the blood level, it's only two to three days half-life. So we started asking the question, should we engineer a molecule that is longer half-life? Because we can't dose, we can't do intersequal dose, you know, like daily or, or every three days. Um, so we were able to, we actually had to come up with, um, we didn't modify the product, but we did come up with a particular, um, a, a, you know, as I mentioned, we need to come up with 100 micro mole soluble enzyme and it was only 15 micromel was that maximum solubility. So we had to do our own tox study, pilot tox studies with different formulations to be able to define a formulation that allows delivery of enzyme at the high level and, um, and actually had to do, develop a device ourselves. So we had to actually go and manufacture, work with manufacturers to de develop a device that would grow with, you know, with, uh, with patients. And this turned out to be um, one where you can actually uh, trans uh, uh, implant the device, the, the device under the skin in the abdomen region and have a catheter that goes into the intercecal space and is sutured in there and the catheter can grow, you know, it has enough length that as a kid grows, it actually grows with it so it doesn't come off. Next example, here's where um, a cytokine, you know, uh, was to be developed and um, there were all kinds, we really needed this, the CMC knowledge, otherwise it just wouldn't make it. So here's an example where during the uh, animal studies, the preclinical efficacy studies, there were many different variants, the different versions of this enzyme made. And there were, the efficacy results were, were um, inconsistent. So um, meaning that you would see efficacy once and, and the other time we wouldn't see it. And so it was like, so basically we got involved, development folks got involved and started asking the question, so how are you, what are you doing with the protein? Well, the protein was being refrigerated until dosing. We didn't know anything about stability. There were no assays around stability. The animals were dosed with Alzat mini pumps. If you know, these are little, little um, osmotically driven mini pumps that you can actually put sub-Q uh, or under the skin in, in the mouth. And you can load them with, say, 100 microliter, 200 microliter of drug, and it delivers over weeks or months, actually, sometimes. So, so the drug is sitting at 30, close to 37 degrees and this was in PBS formulation, which is typically used in, in, in early research, for 20 days. Well, it turned out that the protein heavily aggregates in PBS at 37, and so it explained, you know, lack of efficacy. And actually it turned out with doing pH stability studies that pH 5 is best, so we had to define a new formulation. And then we looked at um, structural, structural and uh, structural stability of the different variants and actually found that some of them are just not stable. And we actually ignored them because they're not stable. And we're able to move into IND, you know, develop IND enabling stage uh, through the right candidate selection and right formulation. Next. Um, so I think here I've summarized, you know, a few the lessons learned is that, you know, to do the preclinical studies with sort of that B, big D development line, line of sight. Um, you want to know, so after you char used characterization tools to understand the molecule, to understand not only its biology but also its structure, uh, what expression system do you use? Is it something that is developable? Otherwise, again, you use a, lose a lot of time. Uh, when you're making materials, is it scalable? Or is it reproducible? Um, and in terms of PKPD, really assess the question of developability. Um, if it's something that is disappearing very fast, it may not be a, a clinical candidate. Next slide, please. And I think I also mentioned enough of, you know, some of the common missteps, right, in product development where the R folks, the, you know, research folks and the lead development folks are disconnected. 
um, because they're not typically they're not even in the same company department. They're not reporting to the same structure. They're not even in the same country sometimes. So, uh, so we've seen the wrong molecule selected as the basis for goal decision. We've seen little to no formulation development, very little analytics or characterization, and these are some missteps in product development. And I think next slide. Next slide. So I think uh, that's it uh, with uh, with the seminar. Hopes that hopefully you found that uh, learned some new things, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. So Sarah, would you mind? Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the wonderful webinar. And I think those uh, case studies are extremely helpful. Um, I think uh, because of the technical difficulties in the beginning, we're uh, running out of time. But I think we're. Uh, if anyone has questions, we're willing to stay here longer and to answer your questions. So, uh, Zara, are you available for a few minutes to answer questions? Sure. Sure. Okay. So, um, we're going to go through some questions. Uh, I think, Zara, on your um, web page, you should be able to see the chat and look at the questions. And to all of the participants, I just want to mention that uh, uh, my contact information is right here, and uh, the Create Bio program. A uh, web page link is uh, is underneath this slide, and if you have any further questions that's not answered by this webinar, please feel free to contact me uh, about the program. And uh, or, if, or if you are interested in applying to the program, uh, you're encouraged to contact us and, and talk about your project. We're very interested in learning about your project. So I'm actually going to go through the, the uh, chat to see the questions I can answer. I just want to remind everyone as well that um, if you, if when you go to your chat and you'd like to write a, write a question, please send it to everyone. We're at different locations, and that way we'll all be able to read it. Um, and I think while um, some of those questions are coming in, we've had a few that have come in. Um, how potentially you could um, address some? There was a couple questions of what are some funding opportunities to support I and D enabling studies? Yeah, and I can address that. Let me go back to uh, one of my early slides and just one second. Okay, so I think this slide might be helpful in answering your questions about what are the funding opportunities to enable I and D uh, enabling studies, and I assume you're asking. Uh, for developing therapeutics that are within scope of uh, an NDS mission, and uh, this is biologics and biotechnology products, which include peptides, proteins, uh, oligonucleotides, gene therapy, and cell therapies, and that's the, the scope of uh, our program. The, um, and you can see here on the slides the Create Bio program. Uh, the goal of the Create Bio program is uh, to enable uh, the PI is to develop therapies, and IND enabling study is a critical step in that process. So the Create Bio program is divided into two tracks. So we have a discovery track and a development track. So the, at the discovery stage, uh, you are um, you can start with a lead and you optimize that lead uh, to a candidate uh, to the extent that you are almost ready to uh, pull the trigger and do the IND enabling study. The actual uh, IND enabling study and its funding is in the development track, where uh, you will be funded to uh, get ready for the IND enabling studies and actually conduct the IND enabling studies, which are typically GLP toxicologies and related uh, studies, and uh, or also conduct a small clinical trials. So hopefully that answers your question. And uh, the details are in the funding opportunity announcement, and the program announcement numbers are on this slide. Um, and how, just while you're on that slide, another question was, what is the extent of collaboration for these cooperative agreement applications? Do they need uh, inside, like NI and DS collaborators, or what does that mean as a cooperative agreement? Okay, so um, the cooperative agreement mechanisms uh, is a uh, assistance to the uh, investigator United studies. So uh, technically, the investigators um, are the, the primary driver for the study. And uh, the program staff are um, more involved than the regular R01s. Uh, 
but you don't have to have an NDS, for example, intramural collaborators. Um, by cooperative agreement, basically the program staff here, for example, for this great bio program, will be um, uh, work substan getting substantially involved in the program, for example, in finalizing the milestones, providing uh, input, uh, providing technical assistance. Um, we will be also making uh, funding decisions, reviewing the uh, the uh, progress report, uh, the annual progress report. We may have uh, uh, meet your calls and annual calls to uh, discuss about your project. Thank you, How <clears throat> Zara. I think we have a couple questions that perhaps you can help with. Um, I think one question is, what are the toxicity studies for a molecule for the brain? Ah, um, okay. So for yeah, for brain delivery, um, basically you you need to do both uh, both uh, exposure. Okay, typically, even if you inject into the brain, like as we've seen actually by a lot of this, they actually come back into into the you know um, blood compartment. So you have to do top studies, not only um, uh, you know delivering to the brain, but also include IV arm in there as well. And but otherwise, the concept is the same. It's still you have to do dose escalation, you know, multiple dosing, dose escalation, repeat dosing. The, the principles are the same. It's just a question now you have to do in both compartments. Does that help? Okay. Is there any? Yeah. Okay. And then I think another one, um, what about blood substitutes for fluorocarbons that are regulated as biologics? Yeah, okay. So, so is the question... Yeah, what is that about? Sorry, I think that's a, a program question, right? Ah, okay, okay. So I guess the question is, are these in scope for the CREATE bio program? Um, so the answer is that these are in scope. Uh, so pretty much we, we, we use a few examples uh, in our funding opportunity announcement, but uh, pretty much uh, anything that's not small molecule and not devices uh, can fit into the CREATE bio program as long as it's uh, under an INDS mission and it's developing therapeutics and uh, that uh, the stage-wise is within the scope. All right. I think we had, another, we had another question. Even though this webinar was focused on recombinant proteins, we did have a question just more related to cell therapy, Zara, so um, perhaps mm -hmm. you can help address it. It's, uh, the sure. question was, what type of doses should be explored for cell therapy? And the example was um, that they have uh, using FDA-approved neural stem cells that are already in clinical trials for some indications. But could you maybe discuss uh, dosing for uh, cell therapy? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's a good one. I, I have to think about that. Obviously, I, I don't have, I haven't done personal, personally, I haven't developed um, cell therapy. Uh, so again, in selecting dose, what I would look for is what have you seen, you know, what, what have you done in, from preclinical studies, right? It's the same thing in terms of if you've seen certain effects, because these are typically, uh, it's a stem cell, so you're typically dosing what, right, in your rating over long-term um, impact. So uh, the, the question is dose response. Is there a, like a minimum number of cells you have to in, you know, inject uh, beyond which is saturated? Um, I, I'm not sure if I can. I'm not sure if I can explain more than that. But you know, um, it really depends on your preclinical studies. The other aspect, by the way, is also around safety, right? How much, if you if you did a certain level of uh, cell, or is that going to you know what's going to do locally? You know, upon upon the site of injection, or you know, is there a safety concern in there? Does okay, that? I don't you. know if that helps. Yeah, I don't know if I think that's helpful, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. the principle is actually very similar. It really depends on the specific cases, um, and the the doses are determined by efficacy and safety. So uh, I guess the principle mm -hmm. is similar. But if you have, um, if you want to talk us further about your project uh, in the context of your project, uh, we'll be happy to uh, speak to you about your specific case. Um, is there another question? We have another question, I think, um, how is related to our program. Um, if a drug has been approved by the FDA for one indication, um, but investigators are using it to treat a different indication, how would they apply for U01 to uh, develop this? Yeah, so uh, repurposing is, uh, is allowed in this uh, program, and we actually have specific language in the FOA 
the a funding opportunity announcement um, about repurposing, uh, there are some additional uh, uh, considerations that you uh, might want to read about. Uh, so the if you need additional, so if you have uh, efficacy, demonstration of efficacy of your agent uh, that's repurposing from, uh, that's repurposing um, uh, for a, a compound or a biologic that has been demonstrated efficacy in other, for other indications, um, you can apply here, uh, but uh, it, it should be clear about uh, what kind of additional IND enabling studies you might need. Um, and for example, if you, are, you have a pediatric uh, population or you have a different dose uh, range that uh, um, the previous indication does not cover the population or the, uh, the uh, dose range that IND, additional IND enabling studies are needed, uh, those can be uh, uh, supported by the CREATE Bio program. I think we there's one more question. Um, it's just related to, to again to stem cells um, and whether they qualify for a program and how I think you've addressed that before that cell therapy is um, in scope as long as it's in our mission. Right, right. And and for your specific case, just please contact us for your specific uh, project. Okay. Anything else? All right. Um, so thank you very much for joining our webinar, and we hope that we have more opportunities to interact with, uh, with you, and uh, hopefully we will be able to organize additional webinars or just a, a question and answer period uh, with our CREATE Bio team. So uh, just stay tuned, and Happy New Year. Thank you very much.